Hello, everyone, and welcome to Be Bold, Fierce, Unstoppable. I'm your host, Zach Lyotis, and in today's podcast, we have the beautiful Alicia Skye. She's an entrepreneur and a cancer survivor. She began teaching mindfulness and meditation to teens and young adults as a method of disease prevention. In 2014, she created Alicia Sky Wellness to educate global brands around the powerful effects of mindfulness in the workplace and in recruiting new talent. After many years of teaching workshops, seminars, providing one-to-one -one and group coaching, Alicia developed her signature program, The Brilliance Method, to provide her clients clarity, a deeper life purpose, and to help them overcome fears while embracing change. Her clients are thriving in their relationships, financial freedom, physical and mental wellness, as well as spiritual intuitive development. Additionally, Elisa is a non-denominational minister and has officiated over a thousand weddings. She shares her time between Nashville and Los Angeles, California, and is happily married to a talented musician and has four rescue babies, two dogs, and two cats. Welcome, Alicia, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's so fun when, you know, we hear our bio or different versions of our bio, and it's like, wow, I, I'm in such gratitude. I have such a beautiful life, and I'm just so happy to be here. Thank you, Zach. Right. Thank you for being here. I remember when I first read your bio, and I didn't really know this about you, but I always I knew when you and I met that we had similarities that you even said, if you and I are going to do things together one day, and here we are, like, how incredible is that? Yeah. About your cancer journey. And that's what caught me. I'm like, no way. Yeah. So how did you go through your cancer journey? It was in 2005 and, uh, I had just turned 24 and I found a lump in my breast while I was in the shower. And as I touched it, I immediately saw into my body and I saw that it was cancer. And, you know, I kind of had that flashback of being in health class where they pass around that rubbery boob with the bean in it. And I was like, oh, okay. Like all the pieces are coming together. This is, this is serious. And, um, I left a message for my doctor. It was like a Friday night. I went in on Tuesday by then a second lump had shown up in my armpit. And she said, you know, you're so young, it's probably just a cyst. Mm -hmm. And that's a very practical thing to assume, especially at that time, you know, now we're recording this in the fall of 2021. And back then it was really unheard of for people to have cancer that young. Now, unfortunately it's more common. So I completely understand why she was saying that, but I knew intuitively, no, something was really getting wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I said, okay, well, well, I need to get a mammogram and a biopsy. Like I didn't know, really know. I was just like, these are the things that I'm, I, I'm feeling guided to ask for. And she said, well, your age and, and all that, you're probably not going to even get covered or get qualified for those types of tests. And I said, well, I have an American Express. Where do I go? And so I was in Los Angeles at the time and I trotted my happy ass down to the Beverly Hills Women's Cancer Center. And I was like, hi, I'd like a mammogram and a biopsy, please. It was like I was ordering a deli sandwich and uh, I got some strange looks yeah. and they, they charged thousands of dollars to my credit card. And so grateful I had one and uh, it turned out to be stage three cancer. Wow. And they, uh, they called me back later that week. My sister went with me to my appointment because they call you and they go, uh, yeah, we got your test results. We want to talk to you in person and you should bring someone with you. It's like, well, that's not good. <laughs> that's never good. So, oh, so my sister went with me and she said, yeah, it's, it's progressing very fast. You could be dead in a month if we don't take care of this now. So, um, I decided that I would do a mix of Western and Eastern treatments. I did wind up doing uh, a mastectomy chemotherapy because I was so young. I was like, I don't know. I, I haven't gone on a journey yet to find out why I got cancer. Cause I didn't really have a family history. My grandmother at the time had just a one minor um, state stage one in her breast, which was common for women in their seventies. And um, especially she was a smoker. So I said, just, you know what, take it out of me, remove the cancer, then I'm cured. And now I'm going to work on the mental health portion mm -hmm. because why did I get sick? And that's what took me onto my spiritual journey, my learning journey, and has really been, you know, that first domino that pushed everything forward. 
We had cancer the same time. I was 23 years old. What the hell, Zach? Yeah. Oh, I just got goosebumps. I'm so I sorry. Goosebumps the whole time you're telling me a story because the doctor said the same thing to me that when I walked in, I had a dream. I had a dream that my grandfather came to me in a bird on a windowsill telling me to go to the doctors because I'm not a doctor person at all all like I don't even go to doctor. I know this about you <laughs> yeah the doctor calls me I don't go to the doctor and he said go to the doctor you have cancer fuck that was my dream so I woke up that morning and I was like let me go to the doctor you have cancer like what the hell and then the next day or that day at work I was a server at that time someone said to me what's that bump you have on your neck and then I had like all these lumps in my neck like you could see it from the external and I'm like, I don't know. And that's when that one in one came together, go to the doctors, you have cancer and that. So I walked into the doctor's office going, yo doc, I have cancer. Like I need to get rid of this. And it was like, it was nothing. Like the way I said it was like, eh, whatever. Like nothing phased me. And the doctor just looked at me. He's like, how do you know you have cancer? And I go to him, a bird told me my dream. So now imagine <laughs> You're telling your physician doctor, the scientist, that a bird told you in your dream that you have cancer. One flew off the cuckoo's nest, right? So anyhow, long story short, he said to me, yeah, we'll get tests. I didn't tell any of my family members about this. I kept it all to myself. I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with the poor you, feel sorry for you and all this stuff. Like I, I can't handle that kind of stuff. So I ended up going to Europe for three months. I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to go and just work my brain around the word cancer alone I don't care about anything else but the word cancer alone and I came back from Europe the doctor was searching for me for three months like where the hell is this girl? like you know we told her we're gonna have a surgery and she didn't even call or anything but I um, I kept in contact with my sister and he was talking to my sister and but my sister didn't know the extent of it I get back I call him like yo doc I'm back in town he's like good emergency surgery on Thursday like that's how severe this was like so when you're saying I could die in a month I probably would have died if I if I had what you're going through, right? Because to me, I has like, I got to get my brain wrapped around this. So yeah. I came back home. I, I had a family meeting with my family. Said to them, I think it was like, a, it was a Tuesday. I said to them, on Thursday, I'm going in for surgery. I have cancer. And they went, what? And I said, yeah. I said, don't worry about it. We're all good. And then it went in for cancer. It was supposed to be two hours. It ended up being six hour surgery. They couldn't believe what they found. He had to save my voice box. I said, doc, if my voice box is gone, just kill me at the same time. Because if I can't talk, I'm not, I don't want to live. So when I was in Europe, I had a lot of like spiritual awakenings. A lot of things come to me. I didn't understand anything. I mean, this was back in 97. Didn't have a clue about what was going on. I was a partier. I was a drinker. I was a druggie. Like I was just doing my thing. Like I don't yeah. know all the spiritual stuff, right? But even though I was attuned since I was three years old, I understood there was another world. I just understand like how it all kind of worked. So then I came home, that happened. And next thing you know, cancer is gone. A whole bunch of other things showed up. And I was like, yeah, that's not on me right now. My, I went back because my aunt was massaging my neck and she found a lump. She's like, no, you have to go to the doctors. I'm like, y'all are crazy. Like you guys all run to the doctors right away. Like what's wrong with you? She booked the doctor's appointment because she was all frustrated with me. And then I go to the doctor. He throws me a pamphlet that says, how to deal with cancer. I looked at the pamphlet. I really like literally looked at it. And I threw it back and I'm like, I don't have cancer. I have stress. Mm -hmm. So he said, I have to book an appointment for another surgery or I can't leave his office. And I was like, mm. and my spirit inside of me kept on saying, just run, just run, just run, just run. So I said to the, to the receptionist, actually, seriously, if you don't book an appointment, um, you, we, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't book an appointment with you. So she goes, just do me a favor, book it. And when you leave, just cancel it. Yeah. It could be medical negligence if they're trying to save your life. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was. So I, then I go to her book because I was like we became buddies with her and I you know while I was going through it and I go to her book my appointment in three weeks I want to come back to see him bless you thank you I said bless you I said I want to come back and see him in three weeks I came back in three weeks and I go hey doc do you want to check to see that lump back there like is it growing and he literally said it's gone I said next time you want to go under the knife and pressure people to go under the knife maybe you should ask him some emotional questions and wow yeah, that was the end of it. So 97 oh, years later, here we are. Good for you. Good for you. But I found out in that meantime, I'll tell you this one. I found out that I had a walk-in when I was going through cancer and they couldn't keep me under for six hours. They were, they put so much anesthetic inside of me. 
that the doctor, when I woke up five minutes after my surgery, six hour surgery, so much anesthetic, five minutes after I woke up going, what's up doc? He goes, how are you awake? I realized that there was a spiritual walk-in that took over my body as my spirit left, my old spirit left. So that's wow. another conversation. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, a lot of things, but what was, what did you have to deal with after that? <laughs> Let's go back to your story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, 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 wait. First of all, you were a server. I was a bartender. Okay. <laughs> While this was going on. And when I went in and told my doctor, I have cancer. She was like, why do you have cancer? I said, I touched the lump and I saw into my body. You know, I was explaining to her medical intuition and she was like, okay. And since then my whole team at Cedars understands if I come in with something, they don't know why I know they just trust me. So I, you know, when we speak from a place of confidence, when it comes to our intuition, like you did with that receptionist, yeah, they hear you, the ones who are supposed to hear you, hear you and they get you. And, you know, until we've done the work like you've done and I've done and so many of your listeners have done. I don't encourage people to not go to the doctor. I'm like, something's wrong, go, right? Have them look, test your blood, blah, blah, blah. But like you said, you need to make the decision for yourself and let it come from a guided place. Now, sometimes we are too scared and fucked up to really hear our own intuition clearly. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's where people get on the wrong track because they either don't take action because they're scared. And then that lump that was from stress does manifest into something worse, yeah. or they ignore something because they feel guilty or worried about it. There was a woman uh, that I ran into in a parking lot and I had a wrap on my arm when I was dealing with lymphedema from my surgery. And she said, excuse me, what is on your arm? And I said, well, I had breast cancer and I wrapped my arm from lymphedema. And she said, you know, I've had a lump in my breast for almost six months and I'm too scared to go get it checked on. And I think I'm going to die. And I said, okay, why are you scared? And she said, because I have two young boys and I'm, I don't know, they're not going to be able to handle it when I go through treatment. And I said, well, I think they'd rather handle it while you go through treatment than handle it if you're not here, sweetie. So go. And she's like, okay, I'm going to, because I met you, I'm going to go. It's like, okay, great. And I don't know what happened with her. Right. But it's again, just speaking your truth, following your intuition. And with you, Zach, you know, you know, it's all that fifth chakra shit, right? All, all that whole journey around how do you continue to speak up? Not from a place of I'm a pissed off fucking teenager, right? Which we did the first half of our life, but from a place of authenticity and compassion for others and ourselves. So thank yeah. you for sharing that with me. I didn't realize that we had such a similar journey. Right. I know. Isn't it crazy? I'm not surprised. No, I'm not. I'm not surprised at all. Between you. There's so many different paths for keep, keep on bringing us together. And that's the, yeah. I, I kind of hear that we were sisters from a past life, but I'm going to get into that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> God, I think we were right. fabulous. God, we had, we had fabulous lives. Right. Right. Um, so you asked me like what happened after that or what did, what did I do? Yeah, after, so after you went through your surgery, you had to deal with the whole mental aspect of it. So what journey was like, how was that journey for you? Oh, well, I had to look at why did I get cancer? And my doctors were trying to figure that out as well because they wanted to make sure I didn't get cancer again, right? So naturally they went to genetic testing and they said, well, as far as we're concerned, it's all genetics. And I said, well, in the research I've done only like less than 8% of this type of cancer is actually genetic. Uh, and I did the BRCA testing because I have Ashkenazi Jewish heritage and didn't have the BRCA gene. Uh, nothing showed up, right? And I said, well, when I looked back at my life, okay, being 24, looking backwards in the rearview mirror, from that moment back, I was like, okay, I was in a mentally abusive relationship with a narcissist. Hmm. I had an abortion from him cheating on me. And that was the pregnancy that I had. And the hormones from the pregnancy, I believe, triggered the cancer that was already brewing and sped it up. And they had said to me, you know, because I was honest about it. I was like, yeah, I had an abortion a month before my tumor showed up. And they said, well, with the rate of this cancer and the type of treatment we need to give you, you would have had to make a choice between the baby and you at some point anyway. And that, so that baby probably wasn't going to survive no matter what. I was like, okay, let there be peace and grace with that. Mm -hmm. But it was traumatic. It was traumatic to get pregnant and to have an abortion. And 
then going backwards from there, living in Los Angeles, pursuing a career as a movie star, putting all your value and self-worth in the hands of casting directors, producers, and all those people thinking that everything that you look like and show up as only matters from an industry or a career perspective, okay? And that is so much hiding and, and horrible anxiety to live your life that way, right? You can't go to the fucking grocery store at 9 a.m. at Gelson's because you might run into someone you just auditioned for and you don't want to look like shit. Like it's a hard way to be if you choose to be that way, which I did for a long time. Mm -hmm. After that, when I was still pursuing acting full time, I didn't give a shit. <laughs> Show up in pajamas and crazy hair, no makeup. Hey, what's up? I'm alive. So are you. Let's book some shit, right? But then again, going back and then just, again, I don't need to go through the laundry list and it, uh, other than my mother was hit by a car and killed when I was 12. And mm -hmm. I didn't really deal with that or process that. I just, I missed her. And, and when she passed away, you know, that was exactly half my life ago from when I had cancer. Yeah. And when she died, I went into a much, her and I did a lot of spiritual work together but I went through an even deeper spiritual process because I wanted to stay communicating with her and connected to her, which I did, but I didn't grieve the fact, you know, just kind of how like you showed up like, Hey, I got this fucking cancer. Let's take it out. I was like, okay, mom passed away. What do I need to do? How do I be an adult at 12? Okay. I need to finish school. I need to get a scholarship to college. What do I want to be like? I had to guide myself, you know, and my dad was kind of in and out and doing his own thing. And there's some stuff I'm grateful for and some stuff I'm not, but, you know, just going back, going back, I'm like, man, I've got a whole life of like untouched grief and trauma as most people do yeah. and they don't deal with it. So then at 24, then going into 25 recovered from cancer, it, the question became not how did I get cancer, but how do I prevent getting cancer? Yes. And that's when I learned about mindfulness, managing anxiety, dealing with fear, just being your authentic self and making decisions from a place of self-empowerment and like what true self-compassion and love is. And, you know, I'm, I am very kind through all that I do, but I have a really low bullshit tolerance because my body will let me know immediately if something is out of alignment and that has kept me healthy these additional, I can't do math. I'm now 40 in 2021 years later. <laughs> yeah, you Your mom's with us, by the way. Your mom's on this podcast with us. <sighs> As you were speaking, I kept on hearing mom's here. And I'm like, no, she's upstairs. <laughs> she's not here. And then I was going to ask you about your mom because typically the breast is associated with mom and nurturing and caring and loving. And it's like, I kept on wanting to ask you about your mom. And then you bring up your mom and I hear she heard me and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, but I was going to ask her the question. So mom's in the podcast with us. Hi mom. Hey mama. Yeah. I have. Welcome uh, to the, thank you for coming in from the other dimension. Yeah. Here, let me see if I can, this is, might look crazy. I don't have a printed picture of her in this room, but oop, I don't want to break that. This is a picture of her. Oh, let me move this light in, uh, in angel form. Oh shit. I don't know if you could see it. Sorry, viewers, yeah. this is not that great. But she had, yeah, um, she had this. She used to wear this, this little wizard, with this amethyst crystal and this angel, and she loved it so much that she had somebody draw a version of her as that wizard. So where I do my work here, I look up at my guardian angel every day. She's a wise sage. I could feel that coming down from her. She's going to make me cry, but I'm not, I'm not going to cry. Okay. Oh, she is. And you know, when she passed away and I worked with a medium, I was like, oh, is she going to come back? And they said, you know what? She's actually done. Like she's moved into the angel realm and she's here to help all of you guys, you know? So unless you really need her this lifetime or the next lifetime, she's done doing her work in the physical form. And I was like, oh my God, that's like what we all, what? <laughs> Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, Thank incredible. You. I could actually feel her energy coming through me so strong. I'm, I'm getting goosebumps over my body. But let's go back to talking about this journey that you had to go through after cancer, dealing with, you know, why did I get cancer was the question that 
I didn't even ask myself that question. I just, I was just like, I just got to get this shit out of me. I don't know why it's here. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing was, you know, something you need to do to prevent not to get it again. And I understand that because that's where I went through the prevention of it. Yeah. And I had to learn my nutrition because I wasn't a very good eater at that time. But what were some things that changed within you as an individual, like while you're going through that mindfulness practice and getting to know yourself, you as an individual, I know we all change as individuals, especially when we're going through cancer, but how did you change as an individual at that time? The biggest transformation was around not feeling like I had to save everybody, mm. which you might think is ironic now that I'm a life coach, but you know, one of my principles is, you know, you can be the life raft where you jump out into the cold water in the dark and you try and wrangle someone and bring them in, or you can be the lighthouse to stand strong and be a beacon of light and love and hope, mm -hmm. right? And, and draw them in and lead by example. And just like you said earlier, you know, with, before we started recording, you didn't go, you didn't live this for 40 years <laughs> You're just to not teach it to people. So to teach and live by example. So when, you know, when I looked back at all that I had been through, I, and I think it was because my mother passed away so young, how could I have prevented it? What could I have done? How can I save? How can I fix? How can I make sure everyone knows I love them in case they leave one day and never come home? And that trauma healed itself through me not actively trying to save people, but mm -hmm. accepting them for who they are loving them unconditionally, learning, okay, if they're not my people, if we don't have the same core values, then I don't have to have them in my life. And that is huge, especially within families. Yes. And I'm not encouraging anyone to cause a rift in their family, but the anger that happens between two people who have different views, especially in an environment that we have today, Mm -hmm. where it's dividing people where you can choose, okay, I'm going to see these people twice a year. I'm going to show up and we're just going to be love because that's all we really are. Mm -hmm. Okay. And look, it's important to speak up and advocate and do the things we need to do for the causes we believe in. But if we're coming together twice a year to express gratitude, just focus on love and meet them at the values that you share. You might not share every value. It's all about keeping the peace. No more drama. Very no well. more drama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just laugh through everything now. I literally, I, I laugh all day long. <laughs> I think I, I, I tell myself, girl, you're, you're the best comedian. Like, I wonder if I'd have a <laughs> laughing because my mind and my spirit say these things. I'm like, yo, where'd that come from? Like, and I just start laughing. And it's true. This day and age that we're living in right now, such huge division happening. It's awful. Yeah. It's awful. So you spoke about love. You spoke about abandonment and you spoke about people, please. And that's a lot all in that one sentence, but Let's go back to the people pleasing and abandonment because as we're going through this process of evolving, growing, creating a career, a business, being an entrepreneur, a life coach, we go through these different mental health situations, abandonment and, and people pleasing and other traumas are part of the process. Yeah. So everything stems from love. We know that already. And I always tell God this, I'm like, that just sounds so cheesy come on, like, give me something else. He goes, no, it's all love. So all love. let's talk about the abandonment. Did you go through any abandonment? Did you go through all that um, emotional uproar? With abandonment? Sure. You know, I, I feel like when, when people are grieving, naturally there is that anger and resentment of the abandonment. And it's not until you go through the spiritual processes of trusting that if we show up on time, we leave on time, Right. That's kind of the deeper way to say it's happening perfectly or it's happening for a reason, you know, and I don't like to tell people it's happening for a reason because that's dismissing their grief in the moment. Mm -hmm. But when we go into faith and trust, okay, if I believe in spirit, universe, God, and God says, okay, you're going to be born on August 21st this year, and you're going to die this year. I can't argue with that. Why am I saying, Hey, F you universe, you're wrong. She wasn't supposed to leave, right? So sitting in that anger for so long doesn't help anything. So going into that place of pure divine trust, okay, if this, if any of this 
illusion feels real and I am participating in it, I know that someone's writing a script. So who am I, right? In my life from Alicia, from this spirit having a human experience, you know, sharing this, this ego and this soul with this fragile body, could I benefit from being angry? No. All that the anger will do is spark a moment of advocacy. Okay, how can I help? How can I make this better? But when we just submit to it in anger, and then we go into, well, now I need to fix it and save it and prevent it. And you act from that place, it makes you sick. Mm -hmm. So really, Zach, it, it, this is kind of a roundabout answer, but it really just goes back to faith and trust mm -hmm. that if I'm going to believe in God in the universe, there has to be a plan. And so abandonment means that that was written into my script and I'm the lead actor. So I got to show up and work it out. Mm -hmm. Now, I like that you said that, but it was written in your script. Do you think you could rewrite your script? That's a deep conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about deep conversations. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, script, right? Because you say the script was written for us, but I believe the script was written for us for a short period of time until we got here. Mm -hmm. And then we had the option if we want to rewrite the script or we want to live under someone else's script or spell. I call it a spell because our parents put us through a spell. The school system puts us through a spell. The government puts us through a spell. We're all in a spell right now going through it. But can we change the script that we are living in today? I feel like the biggest shift and change we can make is our perspective on how we choose to see something. And that's where the little changes happen. I do believe the big plot points are there. Okay. Now, for example, uh, I was going to lose my mother at 12. I was going to go through a big illness and I was going to have the love of my life, right? Let's say that's my script. Those are my big plot points. What happens in between? Yeah, there's some flexibility, but it's mostly based on perspective and how we choose to see the world, how we choose to feel, how we choose to live our lives. It's kind of a depressing thought to think the script is written and locked and there's no changing anything. And what I'm about to say was already scripted. So I'll meet you there. A lot of people who study A Course in Miracles, which I'm a student of, go through what we call Course in Miracles depression, <laughs> where it's like, wait, I have no free will other than how I choose to see the world. It's like, well, actually how you choose to see the world is the biggest free will anyone can have because it leads you ultimately to unconditional love and forgiveness in every situation that's going to get thrown at you. So yeah, was I supposed to get breast cancer or colon cancer? Maybe that, maybe those details aren't there. I don't know. I surrender to, I don't know. I can't say I know, but in my studies and where I've gotten to at this point, I do believe that I could not have avoided getting sick. So then when I go into the irony of, well, then how do I teach prevention? The prevention that I teach is the mental health. Mm -hmm. That if you are strong, that you know how to, and, and this I'm talking about mentally, right? That you have the tools to help you deal with your depression, anxiety, to live a mindful life, to bring in med meditation and spirituality. I do believe it will lessen the severity of any illness that you may get. Mm -hmm. And if you wind up getting sick, you're going to have a much easier experience with it. You're going to not be as mad about it because you're going to surrender to, okay, this was in my script. I can choose to walk through this gracefully, acknowledging the times that I'm fucking pissed because it sucks and I'm human and I'm having this experience and it sucks. Feel it. Please don't bury being upset about something because that's even worse, <laughs> right? We don't want to We don't want to be so spiritually on a high horse that we think we're not allowed to get pissed about shit. Yeah, that's totally if you that's feel that's pissed, good. feel it. What'd you say, sweetie? I said, that's not the way I play. If I feel something, yo, I, you're going to hear it. Yes. Because that has to be felt. That has to be heard. It has to be released and it has to be dissolved away from me. And if I just continue, that's what I call the positive vibes, bullshit bandaid. <laughs> I can't deal with that. Oh, I'm just going to be positive. It'll go away. No, it's not going to go away. It's going to show up differently again. Just deal with it. If you want to yell, scream, if you have to go do it, right? So that's the thing. Like people think you're, you're spiritual. You have to be all this positive stuff constantly. 
life is no life throws us lemon sometimes and sometimes we're gonna have to make lemonade but i'm gonna go back to changing the script because you said something that i want people to actually realize mm -hmm. you, you talked about your perception mm -hmm. right so when we're speaking about perception it is about changing the script because you have the choice if you want to see life to be black or if you want to see life to be light yeah so that's for changing the script again goosebumps saying this to you i've been having goosebumps this whole podcast with you <laughs> but this is where changing the scripts happens you have a choice if you want to go down this deep hole or if you want to go into this light and yes i don't believe i believe i had to go through cancer as well that was written in my script i get it i understood that because that's when my old spirit left and my new spirit showed up and i had no clue what was going on after that so i understand that we had to go through that because that journey that we had to go through that he, that that um, health journey that we had to go through it was actually triggered for us to awaken to become someone better than who we were previously so these types of things happen I lost my dad because I had to learn something different about myself you lost your mom because you had to learn something different about yourself so these things happen at the end of the day there is life and there's death and we have to be happy with what happens in between that but perception you spoke about perception and this is what I want to say because you came from a mental health perspective Mm -hmm. So you've been someone that have gone through the dark of your life and that's how you showed up in the light of your life. And that's how you change your perspective. Mm -hmm. How can you guide someone to change your perspective, to go through that shifting of writing the script to shifting the perspective, to seeing something different within themselves? Yeah. Well, there's a, a pretty big process. So when I created my coaching business, I did all of that. I broke it down. How did I thrive? beyond how did I just live? How did I thrive? How did I go from being in horrible relationships to marrying my king, like this amazing, incredible human being? And I worked it through and it, my program is called the brilliance method because it really is that path of finding that illumination within you, that brilliance. And the, the cliff notes, because <laughs> it's a 12 hour program and a year long class, uh, that we do in person in, in our groups or on Zoom now. Uh, we, number one, start with developing and listening to your own intuition. You have to, to do everything that you just talked about, to shift that perspective. You have to trust her as much as you trust the other people and probably a lot more. And we always want to go to our own voice first. What is the truth within me? What am I feeling? What do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt? And if I'm so fucked up that I can't hear it, I'm going to ask someone I trust to help me get there. And then in the second piece, it's all about fear, fear versus love. I believe those are the only two emotions that we have and everything else that we feel is underneath those two. You can throw any emotion at me and I'll tell you how it's fear-based or how it's love-based. So when we go through this onion peeling process of where people are feeling, you know, truly like blaming other people for everything that's ever happened to them. It either comes down to it's because they're afraid of blank, usually living their own truth and their own beautiful brightness, or it's because they love so deeply like me, I was trying to fix and save and help, but it was also a fear of, I don't want to lose these people, right? It all comes back to fear or love. Then we start getting into your own humanly expressed art, creativity, passion, power. How do you take these things and share them with the world? Where are you truly brilliant? If you're creative on a soul level, how is that expressed as a human being? If you're intelligent, how is that expressed as a human being? And that gives us the confidence and the power to move forward in either creating our own businesses, which most of my clients are doing. Or if you're in a corporate job and you're kind of stuck in the middle and you don't know what the hell you want to do, go through this process to climb up. That's why I do so much corporate speaking. Mm -hmm. When my corporate clients bring me in, I'm like, I just want you to know that when I leave, half of these people are going to quit because not right now, but they're going to wind up doing their own thing or the other half are going to ask for a raise yeah, right? <laughs> Maybe in between someone's <laughs> going to shift to a different department, but I'm going to make sure everybody is shining their light. And they're like, awesome. Like my corporate clients who believe in these same missions to see people grow, they bring me in. Okay. If you want people to stay where they are, you know, and just be mouse mice in your wheel, don't hire me. So I'm pretty clear about that. Okay. And then we, <laughs> then we go into the power of choice. 
So once we've uncovered listening to your intuition, learning to develop it with mindfulness meditation and intuitive practices, overcoming fear, finding out what you are uniquely brilliant at, then we get into choice. That is how you change your perspective. You use all those tools underneath and you realize how I choose to feel is exactly how I am, which is also a Pearl Jam quote. I love Pearl Jam, by the way. From a song called Inside Job, how I choose to feel is how I am. And that everything we do is a choice. And some people say, well, it's not a choice. I have to have this job because I need this much money to take care of my family. I'm not, I don't have a choice. Okay, I hear you. You are choosing to have this job to provide for your family. So bring some healing and empowerment into that's a really honorable choice. And then when you do more of this work and we start to shift and bring a little bit of your passion in, then we start to tip the scales. This is your nine to five that you hate, but you need the paycheck. This is the thing you really want to be doing. You start doing more of this. You have less time for this. This grows. Now we do this. Everything is a choice. Yes. Very much. Yeah. I have a lot of clients who in doing this work, realize the person they're married to might not be their person. And they say, okay, uh, I'm not ready to leave. I want to stay together for the kids, which I have my own opinions about. And (laughs) that, right? Okay, guess what? (laughs) If you've chosen to stay, that's a choice. You are no longer a victim of that person, that partner's screaming at you. That's empowerment. You've chosen to stay. Mm -hmm. Go from love from there. And one day you will choose to leave. And I'm going to hold space for you every step of the way. But what you can't do is choose to stay and then be angry about it. It's about, yes, acceptance of choice and feeling confident and powerful in your choice. I'm not going to tell you it's okay or not okay. You make the choice. Yeah. then you're not a victim of yeah. circumstance. I love that. It's like, I'm laughing because we have so many similarities. Yes. We help women through transitional phase. And I do the same thing as well, but I help a lot of women that are going through divorce. And that was something that I asked the higher powers as to why are women coming to me for divorce? I've never been married before. <laughs> and I just never understood why women would come to me. And they said, because it doesn't matter who comes to you, you're helping them through that transitional phase. So it's interesting because everyone that does do the work, they always end up either getting a raise or starting their own business. So when you said that, that's why I was laughing because it is a natural process of seeing your self-worth and recognizing that there's more to you than this, I don't want to say measly, but then this job that you're holding yourself victim to. And mm-hmm. I always ask my clients, do you like waking up Monday morning to go to work? And typically I'll hear, I'm not really. I'm like, well, why are you doing that? And then they go from that point on. So I love everything that you said. From a mental health perspective, for someone that doesn't say, you know, I like how you said the choice. You have a choice to be in that job to provide. Now, someone going through depression, I'm I'm speaking even from my own experience, and I could answer this question because I've asked myself a thousand times, but how does one change that perspective of self when they're deep down in the hole to say, okay, if I have the choice to be happy, but nothing makes me happy. Yeah. Well, the, so what I shared about my program, that was the first four. There's, there's four more. (laughs) And that question comes right in the middle because um, our fifth unit is about physical Mm self-care and it's more than a bubble bath. And then it goes into mental self-care. I have a a whole module on mental self-care. So once we start choosing, okay, I've made a choice that I want to be happier. Okay. That's the first step to that empowerment. I, I want to be happier because sometimes you're so deep in your shit. You don't even think you deserve to be happy. Mm -hmm. right? So you and I, Zach, are going to hold space for people to know that they are worthy and deserving of a happy life, but they have to come to that before they get to us. Okay. So when people come to me and they're really, really, really deep in it with their depression, I may not be a match yet, 
they may need to go through therapy. They may need to do some of the things that is more traditionally suggested because if someone's coming to me and they're still blaming everybody for everything and they're just, they can't see past their own sadness. They're not ready for coaching. I believe that's unless specifically the type of coach you are is trauma, grief, and, you know, dealing with that. So when, by the time people come to me, they've already done enough work or at least a little bit of work to where they're choosing, they really want to feel better. And there's, and it's not a big step. It's really not a big leap in between, you know, and I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not excluding people who have clinical depression, you know, with chemical imbalances. And, and I don't claim to treat that, but I have helped a lot of people Mm -hmm. with that. Okay. Through this type of work. So just a little disclaimer there, but when we get into taking better care of ourselves physically, choosing to do things physically with our body that bring us light and joy, even if it's just go walk your dog, don't just let your dog into the yard, take your dog around the block, right? Doing those things, physically getting your body moving and then going into the mental self-care piece. And then my seventh and eighth are all about taking action, which a lot of those are learning how to connect authentically and using all the other tools. It helps with depression. Yeah. Because you're actively practicing physical and mental self-care. And then from there with everything else, okay, even if I feel sad today, even if I feel like things are impossible, even if I feel like, you know, everything that I want to create is not, you know, good enough for this purpose, you know, or that I'm not good enough to serve this purpose. Okay. Put your ego aside for a moment, which is really all it is. And I don't mean ego in the way of you think you're cool. Our ego is also there to, to feed our depression and anxiety as you know, right? So put your ego aside and, and remind yourself, it's not about you. If you're really here to be of service and to help people and to show up, even if it's just go to your frigging job Monday at nine, so you can feed your kids, right? It's not about you. You have to get up. You have to do it because there's a greater purpose for you. And in my program, we work through that a bit. I always want people to take action because they believe in themselves and they're worthy and deserving for themselves. But when they can't, when they're dealing with that depression piece, okay, what's the cause that you want to support? What's bigger than you? You think you're not worth it? What's worth it? What's more important than you? Is it animals? Is it the environment? Is it kids with cancer? Is it the elderly? Is it prison reform? Like, what is it? Take action from there if you can't do it for yourself. And when you do that, all the pieces come together. Right. Healing. Absolutely. Yes, it does. It definitely does. Amen. Hallelujah. Raise your hands to the sky. (laughs) Now that everyone is happy because you gave, you gave clear guidance on how to get someone from point A to point B, you know, people are going to write down the notes and take action. They're going to have to, but now you're happy. Now you realize that there's a bigger purpose in life. And now that you wake up every Monday and it's not like, Oh, I got to go to work. Now it's like, yes, I'm going to go to work because I can put food on my table. I'm grateful that I have a roof over my head. The phone is ringing. And that's a huge piece when you realize gratitude is such a key to moving forward. I want to ask you, what is your morning routine like? Well, the first thing that I do, I I always set my alarm at least 10 minutes before I get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So I require being awakened slowly in the comfort of my fluffy blankets and my two dogs. And when my husband's in town, seeing him and just kind of reaching out and touching And, you know, I, I don't like to be thrust awake. (laughs) Some people do. They're like, alarms off, sun's up, I'm up. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm coming out of the womb on my time. (laughs) So I take a few minutes. Okay. 10 is being very, uh, uh, generous. It's usually 20. Um, and an hour, just so you know, (laughs) good. Good, good, good. Um, My, you know, it's not always in this exact order, but I drink my coffee. I meditate. I wash my face. My skincare routine is important to me. I feel good. I like when my skin is soft and clean. Mm -hmm. So that helps me just enjoy my human body even more. And I do take my dogs on a walk. If for some reason I don't have time, then I do spend time with them as much as I can a little bit more in the yard. Just I know that I wake up better when I have a little sunshine. 
So being physically outside is very, very helpful. And I try to do at least 20 minutes of meditation and journaling. Sometimes it turns into 40. So I tend to get up between eight and nine and I don't start seeing clients till 11. And that is because I want all of that to do all of that. And one of my favorite things about my morning is that my mother-in-law and I send each other a gratitude and intention text every morning. And she gets up when the sun's up. So I usually wake up. And by the time I look at my phone, which is not the first thing I do and shouldn't be the first thing most people do, is I read her intention and her gratitude for the day. I absorb it. She's a, a writer and a painter. So it's very visual. And I comment. And then I set my own intention and gratitude for the day. And I send it back to her. And I usually do that before I start my work. So beautiful to set that intention with someone and to give gratitude. How important is your morning routine to you? It's extremely important. And in my ebook, which I want to give to all of your listeners, Mm -hmm. one of the chapters in there is about morning and evening routine. I spell it out even more. And I ask you to declare what yours is. And it goes, you're writing a declaration to yourself. And that's one of the most important parts of my book, which is called the seven secrets to waking up happy every day. So there's no surprise that you're asking me about this right now. (laughs) I think morning routines are important. I wake up at 5.30 in the morning, sometimes 4.30, I think. And I used to need an hour to get out of bed, but now I I literally just jump out of bed. I'm like, yeah, it's sunny up. Like, you know, but it took me about a year to get to that mode. Like it took me a while because I love frolicking in my bed for an hour as I'm wide awake. I'll take a toss and turn, do whatever I'm doing. So I get it. So morning routines, how important is goal setting for you? Well, you know, the word goal is, uh, I don't know how much I love that word um, because it it feels like something far away on the other end of the field, right? So I really love Gary Keller's philosophy of the one thing that when you look ahead, okay, what do I want my life to look like in five years, right? Okay, I know what that is. What do I need to do in one year from now to make sure that thing happens in five years? What do I need to do in six months from now to make sure that one thing happens in one year? Because if the one year thing happens, the five year thing happens. Okay, great. What do I need to do in three months from now to make sure that six month thing happens and work it backwards to where you're literally on today? What do I need to accomplish today to make sure my one week goal, my one month goal, my three month goal, my six month goal, my one year goal, my five year goal, boom. The action I can take today is gonna make sure my life happens the way I want it to in five years. And then from that, you go a little bit deeper, Zach. What's the one thing I need to do right now? Mm -hmm. And it might just be, you know, okay, I need to reach out to that person I connected with to be on their podcast. Because I know that by speaking on this podcast, then in one month, we're going to do a summit and then that's going to lead to this and that's going to lead to this, right? Yes. Yeah. So when I set a goal, it's more about a vision of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think long-term and I think big, trusting and surrendering, there's a better plan. It's going to reveal itself to me, but it's more about what, what can I do right now? And if you have, you know, schedule on your calendar, every single day, some time to do your one thing, then you don't have to worry about a giant to-do list. And if you write a giant to-do list, if you're a list person, then look at your list and go, okay, out of everything on this list, what's important now? The acronym is WIN. So you write WIN at the top of your list. What's important now? I've written 20 things. What's the one thing I can do on this list right now that's going to move everything forward to what I need to accomplish? And you just spent 30 minutes a day on that and your life changes. Then you're not sitting there for six hours fucking around on all these different Facebook things trying to meet one person. No, sit mindfully, intuitively and go, what's the one thing? If I was gonna just do one thing today, then you feel so much more accomplished. Then if you wanna spend five hours fucking around on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all the things, fine, but do it with strategy. (laughs) (laughs) Strategy, excuse me, reverse engineer your life to work towards what you want to create in your life. I like setting up my intentions for the day. So I intend to do this, this, this. I don't like the word goal. So when you said that, I was like, look at that. We're the of course. Because <laughs> I found that I, all the time I put the word goal on my list, like, you know, like New Year's resolution. I even hate that part. 
but the, the goals and years, I felt like it just, it crammed up and it wasn't, it didn't sit with me. It wasn't those words weren't in alignment with me, but I'm like, I'm going to set my intention for today. What's my intention? Okay. I got this, 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 and this, I got to do that, but that, so it's really important. So I like what you said that you look from the reverse engineering process. Cause that's how my process starts too. like, what do I want to accomplish the next year? What do I need to do? And, and it goes from that point on. And there's a lot of hiccups along the road, but yeah. we've got to figure those hiccups out as we come. What would you tell each woman right now that is saying, you know what? Hell yeah, I'm ready to jump into my perspective of living a better life. Well, it starts with that choice. So this energy that's happening right now, while you feel inspired and empowered to take action, tune into what that feels like. Bottle it. Know how to come back to it. Even if it's just sitting and remembering the inspiration to channel it and physically feel it in your body. Because once you start taking action, you do my program or Zach's program or any other program, there's going to be moments that show up where you're like, oh shit, Whew, this is hard. I want to go hide again. Mm -hmm. And it's this feeling you have right now that is so inspired that pulled you out of hiding to where you're listening to this or watching this. That's going to help you when you're hiding from your own stuff and your own life to pull you out. Cause this is your energy, mm -hmm. not Zach's energy. It's not my energy. We're here holding this space and loving you but it's your energy that's going to pull you out. So you need to remember how it feels when you're inspired to take action because there's going to be moments where you don't want to fucking do anything. And if you need a mental health break, great, do nothing. But a day later, or at least a few days later, come back, get back on that horse, love her, brush her hair, shine the light, show her where to go. Yeah. And remember how it feels now because it's so easy to hide. You always get more when you show up than when you don't show up. There's a networking thing, a Zoom thing, a meetup, and you're like, oh, I just feel like shit and I'm not my best self. You know, we all tell each other ourselves this thing. Don't listen to her. That's not the place of empowered, inspired action. Mm -hmm. Show up. If you show up, you might meet that one person that you're going to push their domino and change their life. When that lady in the parking garage was like, hey, what's going on with your arm? I could have said anything. Like, oh, sorry, I can't talk, I'm, I'm late, right? I could have just hid in my shame or my sadness. So I was going through a hard time. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what, take a breath, it's not about you. <sighs> Even if you think, well, I'm showing up to this networking thing and it's about me and I don't feel worthy, so I'm not gonna show up. Okay, that's when we go back to, it's not about you, it's about your cause. It's about the puppies and the elephants and the clean water and the babies. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So many things. If you need a wall full of stickies, like I have over here to tell you, show the hell up, to tell you, show the hell up, that sometimes what you think of yourself is none of your business because it's not the truth. <laughs> it's not, it's so true. I love that. I went through that. I put stickies all over my house, my mirrors, my fridge everything. So I went through that process until the sticky start falling down. And I thought it was a great process to go through because I could hear my guide say to me, what's your affirmation today? And I'm like, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> That's what my affirmation is. Leave me alone. But affirmations are important in the morning, especially when you're having that moment. Like you, like you said, what would you tell your younger self today? Hmm. Oh, just be kind to her. Mm. That's all. Just be kind to her. I was so hard on myself. Right? Yeah. Be kind. Treat her the way you treat other people. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how we treat other people so gentle and so loving, yet we beat ourselves up? Yeah. That still doesn't make sense to me. But we're, shift we're shifting that. Yeah, exactly. One more question before you go. What do you tell your future self today? What do I tell my future self today? So I'm going to talk to my future self. Hmm. Well, that's a good question, Zach. Oh, I've, I've practiced such mindfulness that I've gotten away from the future. But when I look at my process, okay, Alicia, in five years, Alicia at 45, 
I say, congratulations. Mm. You did it. You did it. And I feel that way now. And as hard as I look back and, and, and think that some of those steps were to overcome my own blocks, the big things that I want to accomplish in five years from now, I have no idea how they're going to happen. Right. All I know is the one step that I need to take today to move it forward. And there's going to be tons of stuff in between before they happen. So it's congratulations on sticking to the path, on staying mindful, on being loving, pursuing forgiveness and unconditional love, not letting it shake you, holding space for the healing of the world and for each individual person, because that's not easy. No, it's not. So I want to acknowledge her for staying on it because it's, especially when businesses do really well, you know, my business is doing really well. And, you know, when I see other people online who are posting about their million dollar year or their million dollar month, and I see other people commenting, you know, if you're doing that well, why do you still work so hard? And I'm like, whoo, they're working hard because they want to keep helping people and they love their business and spiritual people are allowed to be wealthy. Let them work hard and let them work well and let them enjoy their lives and give to those causes. Yeah. Right. So I'm on that path and I'm proud of her. So I'm just going to keep acknowledging that I'm proud of her. So beautiful. Congratulations to the future, Lisa, because she's going to make it. She's going to do great things and she's gentle to her kind self. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was such a great conversation. We, you and I could go deeper than this, but Hey, let's just keep it to where it is and everyone could contact you if they need to be. So thank Thank you, you, my love. Thank you. And I I did want to offer my gift. If anyone would like to uh, download my ebook, uh, Zach, I'll give you the the link that you can share with the episode so they could receive something for being a part of this today. Awesome. Everyone, thank you for joining us. If you want to get hold of Alicia, all of her socials are going to be in the show notes below, along with the free book that she has given you as a gift. Also, please join us in the Empress Hangout in a free Facebook group and like us on Instagram. Until we connect again, have yourself a great day and be kind to yourself and congratulate your future self. Bye for now.